Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to number, who knows, some big number in our weekly Transmission Talk Tuesday series. If you're keeping score at home, we got it right one more time. That's the royal we, because if anybody messes it up, it's going to be me. Hey, now, Jeff, I think we're at number 15. I think this is 15. And you know. there we have Mr. Disembodied Voice himself, Ed Sylvester. And uh, we've got uh, an interesting set of sessions today. It's going to be an interesting challenge. Our guest today is uh, Shane Tovin. Uh, Shane's on a site in Colorado and he's uh, trying to dial in. So we may or may not be able to have him. If he doesn't, I'm gonna rely on you folks to uh, tell lots of war stories and we'll make stuff up about all Shane's pictures. Uh, sometimes it's just as much fun that way, maybe even a little more. Before I get going, we'll do the mandatory housekeeping stuff where we go in and we tell you that you can ask questions by typing them in. You can hit the little hand wave and icon. We'll unmute you. If we can't get Shane unmuted, unmuting you guys is going to be even more critical because we don't want to listen to me blathering on for the next 55 minutes. Although that could be entertaining as well. Anyway, so I see folks are already answering the uh, question of the day. And the question of the day for a swag kit was, uh, who is Mr. Disembodied Voice, Ed Sylvester, being uh, represented as right now? And uh, I'm going to give this one to William Harrison, who got him as uh, John in stripes, Bill Murray. And that was awesome. So thank you very much for that, William. I'm going to have Ed reach out to you with an email. Shane, I see you're unmuted now. Are you good? I am. Can you hear me okay? You sound wonderful. You sound like a guy on a telephone. Greetings from a, uh, an undisclosed uh, mountaintop transmitter site in the middle of the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Now, and this is the part where we say, if only there was an engineer to get you connected up of video and everything. But... <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and I know you did this just so we couldn't see the background and make your uh, you know grab a screen grab and make you the subject of another one and and that's cool too. For, hey. for those who don't know, Shane has uh, been kicking around. You started in radio when you were thirteen. Oh my goodness! Yes, uh, at uh, the age of thirteen at KAXE FM in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So imagine this bewildered high school freshman wandering around the call the halls of a local community college, and then uh, stumbling across this uh, you know this door in a hallway that said KAXE. So I wander in, and um, the rest is history. I start doing stuff, hooking stuff up, and then <laughs> it's just all downhill from there. <laughs> That, that's pretty much the way it works for most of us. And, and it's funny, you say wide-eyed, confused uh, freshman. I've been in this industry 30 years, and I still get that face on a lot of occasions. Um, so standard rules, we'll have a discussion amongst ourselves. We'll open the floor for anybody and everybody. Um, any thoughts, ideas, questions, comments, criticisms, or concerns, that's all the alliteration I can handle at once. So our topic today is war stories, uh, the worst we've seen. And it's not really going to be the worst we've seen. I'll paint a visual picture of the worst I've seen. There are no photographs of that particular one. I'll tell you why about that. No, something to do with the country I was in. Anyway, um, we'll talk about uh, not just what we've seen, but what could be done to fix it. And I mean, remember this isn't to call anybody out because, uh, Absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons that things happen the way they happen sometimes, you know, and uh, so I've walked into a lot of sites where the initial uh, initial um, reaction was, oh, oh, why'd you do that? And uh, then you uh, sort of get the backstory a little bit and you understand a little more. So, you know, like I said, no judgments. We're just going to talk about what we have encountered. Um, in preparation, I've had a couple of people emailing me material. Um, John Huntley, I don't know if John's here. I haven't uh, had a chance to look at the attendance list, but he had uh, sent me an email about, oh yeah, John is here, good. Um, John, uh, tell you what, to get this kicked off, I am going to unmute you. If you've got a microphone, 
then you can unmute yourself and uh, tell your story. Uh, the, the one you emailed me three or four days ago. If I don't see your mic turn green in a couple of seconds, then I'll work on the theory you don't have a microphone. Um, let's see, no microphone. Okay, I'm gonna tell John's story for him. He was mentioning about 14 years ago, just started working for a cluster, including a five kilowatt uh, DAD three tower, poking around learning the facility. When a building had been added at the tower base, they'd added a four inch strap around and at the corner nearest the tower, wiggled one of the straps and drew sparks. I'm not the smartest guy or the sharpest knife in the drawer or pick your uh, analogy. Ground systems are not supposed to arc. So three inch four or three, four inch straps are sitting on each other on top of the ground. They'd been that way for years. So turbo torch and a silver solder took care of that. It wasn't the only problem. Checked where the radials intersected the buildings and found those connections were made with soft solder. So as soon as he applied heat to put it on silver solder, part of the strap melted away. So acid core soft solder and all less. Lovely. Went through about 10 pounds of silphos over the next few months, working his way around the building. The usual process, move the gravel, pull the fabric back, solder the wires, put it back together. Um, so yeah, that is a whole bunch of silphos. After he soldered the straps, station began to get calls from neighbors about picking up the station on their telephone. So it's one of the few times where he could say he recognized the job well done by the increase in interference. Um, that is awesome. Thanks so much for that story, uh, John, because uh, yeah, that is one of the better ones. Um, let's see, we've got comments coming in already. Um, oh, uh, John Van Milligan's got a guess at where you are, Shane. So uh, I'm not, uh, you said undisclosed. I'm gonna work on the theory that you don't wanna tell the story or where you are. So we'll, uh, we'll leave it at that. Now, Go into um, the slides. Yeah. It, Go ahead. I was going to say, well, it's uh, like I said, it's. Uh, I think he, he probably does know this site, uh, but uh, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll just keep it at that for the time being. <laughs> so one of the things we see a lot of is uh, creative grounding, to put it mildly, and and these two came from uh, from one of our our customers. Eric sent them to me and. Uh, so how many times have we seen vice grips used for uh, for various grounding situations? You know, well, various connect when you need to make a connection and you don't have anything else, vice grips, right? Um, so, uh, you know, Shane, have you ever run a pair across a set of vice grips at a site? Oh yes, and every time I see that, it uh, kind of scares me. <laughs> it uh, gives you. me an indication of what else. What else might be going on at that site? But again, like you said earlier, you know, no judgment. Uh, things happen. You know, sometimes that you know that's you know you have to do that. But usually, you're only doing that when you're actually soldering the ground connection. It doesn't become semi-permanent. <laughs> right now, so my all-time favorite, and, and like I said, no judgment. You can certainly use them as a temporary connection if you've got to fix it and get it on the air right now. You do what you got to do. Um, but if I come back 10 years later and the same vice grips are holding the feed onto the AM tower, except now they're painted aviation orange, that's your hint. That's a problem. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, oh, I'm got a comment here. I just want to scroll down just a hair. So yeah, Eric, thanks very much for those pictures. They also, I believe, did feature in the Waves newsletter. I especially like the one to the right, by the way. So. I said no judgment, but okay, this time I'm gonna judge, but it's a telco interface. So, you know, we can, we can judge phone company people. So um, what you're looking at is a telco feed and an RG58 for a GPS coming in and that's their connection to the bulkhead ground. Now, I mean, I, I, not, <laughs> I can say there's nothing wrong with that, right? Maybe they even put some no locks under it. Let's see. Uh, there you go. Uh, Kirk Harnack mentions that there's legal and there's what work. A tower crew will install what's legal and an engineer must specify what works or do it himself. Now that, Kirk, is a really good point too, especially when you come to grounding your, uh, your strap and your facility ground to the AC power company's ground rod because NEC has said that you can do that or should do that, must do that since 
around about 2010 or so, so about 10 years. But depending on what state you're in and what electrical inspector you've got, they may or may not put up a fight with that. Um, so certainly it's, uh, it, it's a really, really good point. Um, Gary Morell in, uh, in uh, Michigan mentions that sometimes temporary connections aren't. And I think we've all heard the phrase radio station temporary um, at least once or twice. Uh, let's see. Oh, Ray Lewis is mentioning how to, to prevent, oh, it's got a call from a station in India asking how to prevent monkeys from climbing the antenna all the way to the lightning rod. Um, I gotta say that's probably not the, uh, the uh, that's not a call that I think I've ever gotten. Uh, and Shane, I, I know you spent some time in India. Was that vacation or was that a work trip? No, that was actually a work trip for uh, for a manufacturer that I worked for for a brief period of time. Um, and honestly, yeah, I can't say I have. You know, monkeys are one of the things that I, that I didn't really have issues with out <laughs> during my mm -hmm. installs out there, but uh, it's certainly a possibility. Uh, right. And I, I honestly don't have a good answer to that because whatever you put up, they're going to find a way to climb it. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of other comments. Somebody had asked, and this is a, a really good question, Shane. Um, what is the procedure for, say, you've got a, like this piece of strap on the left with the vice grips? How would you sew fast those together? What's the actual procedure for that? For for folks that don't know. Well, normally, uh, uh, you get a torch, some flux, you get your solder. You do. I mean, you. you want to flex it really good, you clamp the two together, and then you just, uh, you know, you apply heat, you apply your solder, and uh, it should flow together nicely, and uh, you, you can always tell when you've got a nice kind of, uh, nice clean connection after the fact, because it's all, it's, all the solder has flowed in there. Right, so. now a couple of comments there. Um, number one, your flux should be a rosin core, not an acid base, because it exactly. will yep. eat the copper away. Uh, Number two thing is depending on the thickness of your strap, you've got to be careful what you use for a heat source. Uh, I mean, right. if you've got the really thin, almost tinfoil like strap, then a propane torch might be all the heat and then some. You're, but if you start using oxy or map gas, you're going to just uh, vaporize that strap. Yep, that's so, an excellent point. And I mean, the other thing is that it a lot of it just comes down to practice. You know, grab a couple of quote unquote yeah. sacrificial pieces of strap, but uh, for something like this, you pretty much got to use flame. You're not going to use even a heavy duty soldering iron because of the heat sink properties. You just would never get it warm enough to melt. Exactly. Um, well, and one other thing, to, one other thing to be conscious of, uh, if you do use um, grips, vice grips like that, they make some even with a nice flat plate on them that, uh, that can clamp these together. But be aware that that will also become part of your heat sink. <laughs> so, yep, yep. So, well, and that's exactly it. I mean, I've run into situations where folks used a couple of copper bars to clamp stuff together. And and yeah, I mean, it, it can be a really challenging uh, thing to get enough heat on it to uh, to actually take the solder, especially Silfos, which has got a higher uh, melting point. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the best answer really, the, the number one, the flux, because you've got to clean it. If it's not clean, then you'll be standing there all day and you'll never have a good connection. Um, Kirk Harnack uh, also mentioned, uh, have you done any CAD welding, Shane? I have, and uh, CAD welding is actually really, really cool. Um, yeah, you put uh, stuff up on purpose. I mean, what's wrong with that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's a great thing. And uh, so yeah, Kirk asks, how does one get profession, proficient in, Kirk, I'm, I'm going to tease you a little here just because I can. I might even open your mic so you, because I know you've got a good humor about that. But uh, I forget what it's called, the burn explosive method for attaching ground wires. So yeah, we're going to unmute Kirk for this one and just make him part of the conversation. Let me scroll down the list a little bit here. Here you are, sir. And uh, oops, there, you good? I'm good. Do you hear me? Oh, well, loud and clear. You sound wonderful <laughs> as always. <laughs> All right. Well, I have so, a crank so to 11, so, so there you go. Well, given who you work for, that makes sense. 
So uh, for anybody who doesn't know him, and I think everybody knows Kirk, but uh, Kirk was, works with, uh, with TELUS uh, as uh, Vice President Market Development. Did I guess right? That I'm throwing a dart here. Uh, that, that's a big dart. Yeah, I, um, uh, I guess my title at the moment is uh, Senior Solutions Consultant. So I, uh, people come to us with uh, square pegs and we show them how to fit in the round holes. Wonderful, wonderful. I always thought you could put a square peg in a round hole with a big enough hammer, but <laughs> we we uh, we show them the big hammer, or we show them how to shave off their. You, you know what's what's actually the common answer, and this ought to be for a lot of engineers. Have this handy in your brain. Um, you know we can absolutely get that done. We don't do it quite the same way you're thinking of, but let's look at how we'll get this done for you, and maybe it'll work out better. Let's take a fresh, you know, let's look at a fresh approach. There's a lot of folks and hey, sometimes engineers come to us or to other engineers and, and they, they, they tell you how they want to do something. What they're really saying is I need to get this done and I need to have these mm -hmm. options and this flexibility. So uh, right. a lot of times it, it maybe it, it really can't get done the way you're imagining, but there is a way we can get it done. Right. I mean, sometimes, you know, the, you've got the end result and you've got sort of a picture of how to get there, but it's based on your own experience. So sometimes, yeah, you uh, have to draw the, draw the, redraw the picture a little bit. Sometimes, uh, sometimes yeah. you, you want to use that phrase from that commercial. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> right. So, so to get back saying, to your, uh, ask, what's the old saying? Ask 10 different engineers, get 30 different answers. Oh yeah, that's possible oh, too. Yeah. Easily, easily. Now, uh, going back to uh, your original comment, you'd asked how one gets proficient in, uh, in CAD welding. Uh, and the easiest way is just to buy a bunch of molds from Amazon and, and again, practice, 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 get a ground rod and attach a bunch of wires to it. That's a, I hadn't thought of that because Amazon didn't exist when I had a real need to do this. And so I used, uh, you know, uh, back in the uh, 80s and 90s and early 2000s, uh, Amazon didn't care. But I'm, thank, you, thank you for pointing that out. It's a great way to go get those supplies. And I guess there's, there's got to be some, uh, some YouTube videos or papers on, uh, on best practices. And just how, I mean, if Shane Tovin isn't handy to show you how to do it, you know. I'd, well, the cool thing about... Say the cool thing about CAD welds, if you buy the one shots, they're already preloaded and they're sized specific to the wires or rods you want to attach. Oh. So you you literally can't screw it up. I mean, if you get the little sizzle pop, it worked. But gotcha. uh, but but <laughs> if you buy the permanent molds and the powder, the, the it's, is Shane, is this like a magnesium or a thermite type blend? What do do you know anything about the powder itself? I'm I'm not exactly sure what it is, but something, you know, something to that effect. Uh, I do know, though, that you can't ignite those uh, those little pre-filled charges uh, without the, uh, the special igniter. I'm not exactly sure what they, you know, how they ignite those things, but, um, you know, I've tried several different other methods, but if you, you know, the little igniter that clips onto them, and uh, if you don't have that, um, it's, you, you, I haven't figured out a way to get those things to ignite yet, I'm sure. I, I guess sure so. I guess they have a variety of uh, of sizes for you know different size tower legs or ground rods and different size wire. Right. Do they have what I'm what I wonder is now asking for a friend. I want to get one that would allow me to CAD weld a chain, which which might be camouflage painted, a chain to the rear axle of the competitor's remote van. Do do they have that? <laughs> <laughs> I think asking you have to be extra for <laughs> You might have to uh, do uh, go go back to American Graffiti for lessons on how to do that one. And, and uh, Jeff, just one more thing. Uh, I'm sure you'll get to it, but oh my goodness, there is no better paper tome in the world than the Nautel tome on on. Uh, it's titled uh, what? Um, Lightning protection for radio transmitter stations. Uh, right. it, 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 uh, it doesn't apply entirely to RF grounding, but if you do the lightning stuff, right, you've got a pretty good chance of getting your, uh, your RF grounding correct. And I, I, ever since I read this back in probably the late 1980s, I always, uh, redesigned fresh transmitter sites so that the RF pipes in and out of the building were on the same side of the building as the AC power lines in and out of the building mm -hmm. and so many times these are on opposite ends of the building which you know you've got some solutions on how to correct that the best that you can but right. hey start right to begin with and it becomes a much safer uh, experiment right and i mean historically you know or 
typically the uh, power comes in from the road and the antennas out back. So that's yeah. why. <clears throat> but but yeah, there are times where running the power to the back and bringing it in adjacent to the uh, to the uh, RF feed is a whole lot more convenient. That's for well, sure. Well, the way to fix that is to just reposition the building slightly, and then you can get them both on the same wall. Yeah. Uh, John Huntley does mention that you can, uh, Shane, for what it's worth, ignite uh, Cadwell mold with a blowtorch. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I figured flame would eventually do it, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't get quite that brave. There's nothing electrical that I could find would do it other than that igniter. Yeah, no, I've never seen a piezo or a piezo igniter type thing that would do it at all. So uh, definitely, that's uh, some good points there. Uh, Eric's case mentions that eBay often has uh, surplus material from construction projects, including CAD weld materials, cold shrink, and stuff like that. So that's also useful information. All right, moving on. Yeah. Let's see okay, here. Yeah, let's just take some tries, take some practice. Well, right. I mean, you don't. Do you know it, you you don't weld uh, the drive shaft on a baler perfectly the first time you do it after your father replaces the shear pins with quarter inch steel bolts either, but after about the third time you get pretty good at it, or so I'm told. The instructions they include with those kits are actually yeah. Now this one, I forget where this one came from. Oh, no, I know where this one came from. I do remember it uh, actually was one of your cohorts, past or present. I won't uh, won't go any further than that. But uh, a lot of times we'll get to something and we'll start something. And then, of course, you get called away. We get pulled 18 different ways. So what do you do to help remind you to go back to do it later? Well, normally I would, uh, you know, I would put some kind of little... Uh particular notice in my, in my uh, calendar, or, you know, for my next trip, I would, uh, I usually, when I would plan my trips, I would have a list of everything I needed to do at each site. And I would make sure that if I, you know, left something at a site that needed to be done, I'd make sure it got added to that list. Uh, and on that list, I also had materials that I would need to bring to that site. So that was a good way to keep track of that stuff. That's actually a really good point, though. I'm kind of a spreadsheet sort of guy, and uh, that's something you could open an Excel spreadsheet with a tab for each site and just a little punch list of things that need to be done. And that way you've got something dynamic that you can modify, store it on OneDrive or something, and it doesn't even matter what device you're on if you uh, cloud base it. Yeah, exactly. There are a bunch of different ways to do it, but uh, some mechanism for tracking that, uh, you know, what needs to be done and what you need to accomplish those things is, uh, is really helpful. Yeah, yeah. So that that's uh, yeah, that is uh, just one of those things. Oh, Eric mentions that Trello is a good tool for tracking tasks, checklists, setting due dates, and can be shared with your whole team. So yeah, one note. That, I know people who use OneNote for that sort of thing as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I mean, if you're a Microsoft Teams type of company, there there are a bunch of tools, uh, planners, etc., that uh, work well for that at all. Um, Rich uh, Rich Hahn mentions, and he's got a very good point. Uh, he, he says second best to the Nautel grounding publication, but the uh, the Motorola R56 uh, documentation. Yes. And I mean, Motorola is the, the R56 standard is pretty much the the gold shield, the gold standard when it comes to uh, setting up facility grounds. It does do a lot of stuff that is a little extraneous to what we need to do in a broadcast facility, but uh, but if you follow it, you won't go wrong. Well, and there is one caveat to that, and this applies to really any grounding scheme that you, uh, that you put in place. Anything that's added on that site later must continue to follow that standard, because I've seen uh, cases where a contractor has come in and installed some stuff at a site, and suddenly, you know, they can just ground it wherever they feel like. They bond it and install it, you know, wherever. Uh, so unless those standards are documented and you make sure that everybody who goes on that site adheres to it, um, you might as well not have any grounding at all. You can get all sorts of weird combinations that happen that uh, aren't always for the better. Right, and that comes back to the uh, the email from John Huntley that I opened with where he had uh, three different straps laid together. I mean, things just get added over, over the years, sometimes with a little thought, sometimes with a little less thought. And, uh, you know, sometimes it can turn into... There's a phrase I can't use in play company, but it can turn into kind of a mess sometimes. Um, one other thing, and this is a little side note, don't ever put your surge protector in the rack 
please, if you can avoid it at all. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Ideally, the surge protector will be as close to the entrance as you can get it because the wiring from the entrance to the surge protector is the, the resistance of that wiring needs to be as low as possible. Otherwise, you're reducing the effect, effectiveness of the surge protector. So if you put it in the rack, what you've done is made the wiring to the equipment as short as possible. Any surge the surge protector gets at that point, the equipment is almost as good a path. So whenever you can put the surge protector near the main entrance. Now, Shane, have you encountered anything like this? I'm looking, that looks like uh, one of our, might be a J1000, I think. Yes, I, I have seen surge protectors installed in all manner of um, very, uh, let's just say creative ways. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this one, I also see that um, it looks like the, you know he's got the he's got that flex conduit, which is uh, just everything is just kind of right up against his ground straps there. I mean, it doesn't it looks like he's just yeah, kind of entirely defeated the purpose of the uh, surge protector there. Generally, you're going to want that um, close to your AC entrance. I don't buy your uh, your electrical. Yeah. Plan. Well, it's it, it's like I say, it's just not. Uh, yeah, it, it's. I mean, sometimes again, the the, the pressure's on. You get it done, uh, however way you can. But uh, but there are definitely uh, some things that you should try to avoid when at all possible. And I mean, if you're in a situation where you've got a rack in a room and it's a leased space, and the rack is the only thing they let you have, then okay, maybe this is better than nothing. But uh, but if it can be avoided, it really should be. Um, speaking oh, that's of, a good point. yeah. Speaking of avoiding stuff, I picked this one just because it said no admittance and I, it fit in a no admittance, <laughs> no problem. Um, housekeeping, the groundskeeping is uh, obviously sometimes it's contracted out, sometimes it's left up to the engineer to do it. And a lot of times, again, we get busy and shoot down southern states, especially in the spring. I mean, you can mow a field and three weeks later it'll be chin high. So, uh, well, you know, but definitely it's a requirement yeah well and that, i'll uh, you know i'll, I'll make a <laughs> uh, there's some cases where that's uh, that can be easier said than done uh, i think for example you know sites that are in the middle of the jungle on a, on a tropical mm -hmm. island uh, and kirk i know can relate to this one so um bring your machete <laughs> you go to visit those sites literally yep yep and I mean, you know, you, uh, yeah, you definitely are limited by both resources, time and uh, and what's available, you know, and whether or not the site's manned at all or not. But uh, but whenever possible, if you uh, just make sure you've got the gear to get to it, if you've got one of those kind of sites. Um, Kirk says that what you've got shown there is six days of growth in American Samoa. Uh, yep, exactly. And that's, that was why I was kind of pointing that out. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I do have uh, one more vegetation picture we'll get to in a second. I'm going to leave it up to you to twist for a second or two and guess. Uh, uh, Curtis had asked, what about mounting the surge protector battery backup in a rack with the equipment? And that, like a battery backup in, in the form of a UPS or, or something similar is a little less of a concern because at that point, you're also providing isolation to the equipment. So the equipment is not really seeing the surge protector the same as it would with the shunt type one in that was in our picture. So right. good, Chris, yeah, that's actually much. pretty common. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's a very good point, Curtis. Thank you for that. Yeah, I've got no issue at all with putting a UPS or a, a voltage uh, regulator, some sort of isolation device in the rack. Uh, that was the other picture there. I really like this one. Uh, now, for yeah. those of us who are a little cautious, shall we say, about the wiggly, squirmy things, um, the, the nope ropes, some people like to call them, I'm not a snake fan. Um, a site like that, you might have to do some sweet talking to get me in the door. Let's see, if that's an AM site, you might notice a change of base impedance too. That is another really good point uh, Gary mentioned. Uh, and Gary, uh, I'd, uh, I think, I'm not sure if you've seen that particular picture or not, but I've got a shot of a site where we were getting calls about SWR trips, about reflected power trips. And it was tripping every morning. They go to day power and the transmitter just hiccup, hiccup, hiccup. 
they'd put it back to night power and it'd run okay. And then after an hour or so, they could put it to day power and it'd come up. And then, of course, transmitter problem. So the first thing we said was take a look at the antenna. And they nope, the antenna's fine. So after a while, we back and forth. I think for three days, we troubleshot it. And I finally got to where I looked. I, I said, look, you need to get a dummy load because we don't know it's a transmitter problem yet. So he went away. And about three weeks later, this is uh, pre-internet days, I get a letter in the mail and there are two pictures fell out. One of them was a picture of the base of an AM tower and you couldn't see the base insulator for the vines growing up it. The second one was the same tower after it had been cleared. So uh, definitely, yeah, sometimes, especially on AMs, uh, keeping the vegetation away is a very, very good idea. Now, Ray Lewis asks, uh, what about the pros and cons of a large UPS for a VS300? And, and Shane, you, you've run big UPSs on small transmitters, and VS300 or any other transmitter would be about the same. So what, what's your... Yeah, I have. And in fact, if, if you've got the UPS capacity for it, go for it. I mean, it, it can only benefit. It really There's really no downside to it, quite frankly, other than the fact that uh, if your UPS does happen to fail and you don't have some kind of external bypass, uh, yeah, I mean, that means your transmitter goes down, but generally that means you'd have to go to the site anyway because you'd have other critical equipment that would be down. So, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's like anything else. I mean, from a power perspective, there's no, there's not really any downside other than that. Yeah. Uh, one other comment on the R56 standard. If you uh, print a hard copy of uh, R R56, just keep it in the bathroom. It'll take a while to read the whole thing. Uh, always good information. All right, moving forward. Uh, this is one of your pictures. So tell me what I'm seeing. I know why I chose it, but uh, tell me what I see. Ah, okay. So this was actually from uh, a trip to another island. Um, the one on the, these are both, uh, as you could probably guess, related to a hurricane. Um, so the one on the left there, uh, there was a there was a relay site uh, out to some boosters from a main site, and. Um, I'm going out. I'm going out with our, you know, our contract engineer to try to look at some of these sites, and he takes me to this site. Um, wasn't quite in the middle of the jungle, but it was, you know, it was a little bit out of the way. And I'm looking around. I'm going, what site? Where? Where's the site? And <laughs> well, come to find out, the the tower was no more. So all I see is this concrete bat with coax trying to cross the top of it. Um, and then, of course, underneath, there's a, you know, there's a little room there that uh, you know, where the equipment was, and it was uh, was not all that. Uh, not in all that great a shape either, uh, but uh, but yeah, it's like okay. Um, That's not so something we see every day. Looks like I'm muted, uh, or am I not? No, you're good. You're good. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so then on the right side there, that's um, it's from the same uh, the same trip, also hurricane related. Um, that is what is left of the base, of one of the legs of a massive uh, self-supporting tower obviously after everything had been cleaned up. So the story there is a uh, you know, hurricane had come through. There were two towers directly adjacent to each other. Uh, the building was right underneath both of them as well. Um, this particular tower failed in such a way that it, uh, it kind of corkscrewed, missed the building entirely, missed the other tower entirely. Again, these are both freestanding towers. Um, but that was kind of a, kind of a reminder there of the power of these uh, these storms when they come through. So yeah. um, thankfully we were able to get back up and running on the uh, other tower there. <laughs> Just got yeah, that station so, back full steam not that long ago. So my all time favorite in that regard wasn't a storm related, but uh, somebody called me once and they, they said, we're off the air, we're headed to the site. And uh, I'm okay, fine, whatever. And uh, I'm expecting a call in another hour or so and kind of keeping the phone clear and an hour goes by and then two hours go by. And at that point, it's like, okay, back to work. And uh, it's three or four hours, something like that. He calls, he says, sorry, I uh, just, um, the, the police just left. And uh, I said, excuse me. He goes, yeah, I figured out why we're off the air. And I go, what's that? And he goes, our transmitter building is gone. And I said, gone? Did you have a fire? He goes, no, no. Somebody drove in on a trailer, hoisted it up and left. Um, tower's still there, but they took the building. Wow. Well, turned out the end result was the uh, the owner in that case had uh, not been paying his rent and the uh, landlord uh, repossessed the building. 
um, with everything in it. So there you go. It's not you don't see every day for sure. Yeah. It's not the most common. Now that, on the other hand, is something we do see quite a bit more. Yes, and uh, this was uh, this was another island uh, site um, where, um, yeah, critters happen, and um, that was not something that I expected to see walking into that site. Um, uh, needless to say, that particular little critter was deceased, and this uh, I wasn't about to reach into the panel and uh, try to remedy this, but um, yep. and, uh, you know, we had uh, for years in our final test department, we had a little crispy salamander on a, he was taped to a piece of paper that came in with a note that said, uh, I found, I just wanted to send you the remains of my assistant, assistant engineer. He always wanted to see Canada. Um, and a customer had mailed it to us from South America somewhere. And uh, yeah, it, it stayed on the wall in final inspection for, for a whole lot of years. Uh, may still be over there somewhere, I don't know. They've uh, moved a few times since then. Um, and then we've all got the stories about snakes around contactors. Uh, that's a particularly wonderful smell. Um, I ran into a site in Paraguay with coral snakes in the, uh, in the got wrapped up in a power rectifier, um, again, not the prettiest thing so uh what do you do to uh to try and keep the critters out for the most part uh i mean there's i know i've written articles about it so so what are your tricks you just have to find every possible little hole that you can and and seal it um that's about the only thing you can do i mean conduits um uh, the expanding foam is messy but that that works one thing that i've used in the past for uh, at least for mice is uh, sometimes steel wool in those uh, in those conduit openings as well but um, uh, one particular spot to pay attention to is the door sweep because a lot of people don't necessarily that doesn't always you know a lot of places don't have a great seal there underneath the door that's a, mm -hmm. a common place for them to get in electrical conduits um, so we had I, I had one site where there was a you know an, an abandoned conduit that uh, ran to the outside um, one of the uh, J boxes for the uh, for raceways along that conduit that kind of rusted through. So critters were getting up in there through that uh, rusted J raceway J box, mm. and literally they it gave them a super highway into the site, into the building, <laughs> because the mm. other end of that conduit was not plugged. So, uh, so just find find whatever small openings you can, no matter how small, and seal them. Yeah. Now, Kirk Harnack makes a really good point, um, and this is something that I recommend to people: is uh, mothballs in a dish. Um, you know, just like a little margarine container with a handful of mothballs in it. Uh, he says some folks say it doesn't work; they think it does, uh, but they don't see a lot of snakes in uh, in those sites or mice, as far as that goes. Well, and I also uh, I also was in the habit of uh, putting these little ultrasonic. Uh, pest repellers in the uh, in the equipment rack, plugging in one of the power strips. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if it did much good or not, but that, uh, along with the mothball, I mean, it, it did seem to reduce the problem. We didn't have many critters in the racks anymore. Yeah. So. Now, William Harrison mentions a good point. Don't the snakes help keep the mice population down? And that is quite, quite true. Uh, you got to remember that I spent most of my service days uh, careening around hot and humid countries where 90% of the snakes I encountered were of the un, uh, unfriendly variety, shall we say. So, uh, so I just uh, work, <laughs> I, I just work, sorry, uh, Kirk uh, put a little note here. He makes, uh, he, he saw a bunch of mice having a camp meeting around a bunch of those ultrasonic things. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> and so, so the, uh, the mothballs may be what's doing the trick for you. That, that's uh thanks kirk that was a, a cute little chuckle to get there um so talking again about radio station temporary this is uh this is a situation where they did what they had to do the uh ball gaps i, I forget whether they rusted off got blown off uh, otherwise fell off but uh it at least did something now having said that you'll notice on the other side that the uh ground side ball gap is just shoved into a piece of conduit I'm not sure how much it did, but something anyway. So again, creative, you do what you gotta do sometimes. Uh, I think the next slide, Shane, is one of yours. Tell me a story. 
Oh, uh, it, yes. Right off the bat, okay. it looks like the uh, terminal block sacrificed itself to protect the MOVs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, among other things. This uh, this was another one of those special sites where, um, you know, a lot of times you, you if you're releasing at a site, you don't necessarily have a lot of control over the environment at that site, uh, other than improvements that you uh, that you might make. Well, this site, um, uh, let's just say it was a mess electrically. Um, and it had, had you know, several problems in the past where the neutral had opened up. And uh, couple that with some good storms rolling through, and uh, well, you have a recipe for disaster. And um, this is one uh, piece of the carnage from that. Um, it's inside, like I think, a Crown a FM 500, and uh, one of the Crown series, I forget which one. But anyway, um, yeah, basically the, uh, the terminal block sacrificed itself to protect the MOVs. Um, but, uh, we actually did get that rig running again, uh, amazingly. But, um, but yeah, that um, that was not a fun incident. Yeah, uh, the Kirk also mentions back to the vice grips that uh, vice grip pliers cost too much to use them as temporary clamps. Kirk clamps, that's craziness. Um, let's see, clearing the electronic. Oh, here's a good point too. Uh, talking about the uh, conduits and plugging them to keep mice out. And uh, Rich Hahn mentions that uh, clearing the electronic underbrush, abandoned conduit, unused cables, et cetera, um, not only helps keep the critters out, but uh, pays other dividends, reducing hum, intermittence, inadvertent shorts. Um, and, you know, there is, uh, he's pretty sure the NEC actually requires removal of unused conduit and cable. I can't speak to that, but uh, definitely removing the stuff that isn't used makes uh, troubleshooting things a whole lot easier, too. That's an Excellent point, and one of my big pet peeves at sites is abandoned wiring, um, you know, that didn't get pulled. And I know sometimes it's not easy to pull that stuff back out, especially where it's been stacked on top of and on top of and on top of. But if you keep pulling it out when you don't need it anymore, then you don't have to keep stacking on top of and on top of and on top of. So. And that seemed to be a perfectly good segue for me to go into my next slide. Um, and it's another example where, the, so you've got in this particular rack, there are five transmitters and an HD generator. And, you know, it, it was a get it on the air situation. It's leased space. So one rack is all that they wanted to pay for. And obviously budget factors in. So you do what you got to do. But in this particular case, pulling a lot of the excess wire out and tying it back would uh, really help the airflow, for example, among other things. Um, uh, and I know you've posted one or two folks or photos like that over the years. Right. So one thing I see a lot in racks, um, you know, the, I, the IEC power cords on equipment are infamous. Um, a lot of times I will see just nests upon nests of these black IEC power cords in a rack, and it's just impossible to trace. Uh, well, there's an easy way to clean that up. Uh, if you get a, uh, a vertical power strip, some kind of, you know, or an, if you've got the budget for it, a, a nice, um, what they call it PDU, power distribution unit, where you can you know, mm -hmm. uh, plug all that stuff into and use the short, they make really short IEC cords, anywhere from like one foot to you know, one foot, two foot, three foot, whatever you need. Yep. Um, that you can cleans it up by length. considerably. Yep, exactly. Yep. And over and above that, the advantage of that is if you go with one of the IP66 uh, power strips, the ones that are internet accessible, you've got the ability to turn individual outlets on and off if you need to power cycle a piece of gear without killing the whole rack. I have another story about that, but that's, <laughs> that's a different subject. Uh, let's see, hey, clearing the electron underbrush. Okay, we're there. I thought I saw something else. Oh, I did see something else pop up. Um, yeah, uh, make sure your main electrical, here, I've got a, there, make sure your main electrical entry is not a path for mice from the meter panel. So, yep, same deal. Oh, one other note, and uh, John uh, brought this in, and, and it's a really good point. I meant to mention it and forgot. Uh, you were talking about using steel wool to uh, to block the mice. And remember, too, that steel wool will oxidize, turn to rust, and disintegrate over time. So you can get both stainless steel and copper wool, and they both work really, really well for stuff like that. 
Yep, that is a good point, and it's going to depend on your environment as well. Most of the environments I was in were fairly dry, so uh, oxidation like that wasn't really a consideration. But yeah, in other environments, yeah. that's certainly going to be an issue. I'm going to say where I live, uh, humidity, you know, 80% humidity is a dry day. Now, speaking of humidity of the frozen variety, that does not look like a place where I should be seeing snow. Did you advance the slides? I'm not, oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. This um, this is one of the very first uh, calls that I got when, uh, when I had just started out in uh, Wyoming. Um, I got a call that uh, one of our stations is off the air, and you know I just been hired on there as a you know as the, uh, one of the engineers. I go out there with uh, one of the other engineers. We go up to the site, and um, first thing I notice is there's a weather hood missing from the side of the building. Well, that's never a good sign. Second thing I notice is that the snow is blowing directly at that inlet. Okay, that's not a good sign. And the louvers are completely open, forced open. And the transmitter is off the air. So guess what happens? <laughs> snow blows in, and what you're looking at here is the top of a BE FM30 transmitter, and that's uh, the mm -hmm. tuning stuff right above the PA cavity. Um, so you can about imagine what the PA cavity inside looked like, along with the rest of the transmitter. And mm, uh, yeah, like an ice box that needed up. defrosting. Yeah, it was off the air. It did manage to get it all cleaned out, but um, it took a lot of work to get that transmitter back. You know back up and running again including a new tube socket um, yeah and things. that uh that that leads into one that uh alex hartman has posted before uh showing the value of uh having one of the ip enabled this is a wise cam it's a 30 dollar, 40 dollar if you want ptz pan tilt zoom capability but uh a site in minnesota where the door had uh blown open been left open whatever the door was open and uh so yeah, the cheap cameras are a, a really, really good thing. I mean, cheap cameras are a really, really good thing. This is one of yours too, generator, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, that would be the generator room of, uh, of a different site that uh, I once uh, <laughs> was responsible for, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, um, that is oh kirk harnack says he if you want a couple of transmitter site stories i've got them one is horrific and the other is instructional well of course kirk we're going to un or i think you're still unmuted from last time but uh yeah i am yeah i am going to say let's start with horrific because oh, okay. if it, leads, it leads uh i i think it's i think the statute of limitations is is well passed i'm not going to name call signs but i will say that there's an AM FM transmitter site, and I don't know if it's still AM FM now. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, it was an AM FM transmitter site near Memphis, Tennessee, and it was in a floodplain. It was on the west side of the Mississippi River, a uh, very large floodplain, and uh, several times it, it did flood there. Uh, it was a, like a five-tower AM array, and then the tallest tower, of course, uh, held the FM antenna. Uh, everything was elevated. The tower bases were all elevated uh, about 15, maybe 20 feet or so. That was kind of new to me. And the transmitter building itself was elevated maybe, oh, wow, 20, 25 feet. It was way up there. Uh, well, the transmitter building was pretty big. And in the transmitter building on any given day would be an elderly couple and their 23 dogs. Yeah, in the transmitter building. And the dogs lived in the transmitter building and the couple lived in the transmitter building. And okay. apparently it was a deal. They were friends of the director of engineering of the company. Now, I was a contract engineer, and even though, you know, I gingerly and gently complained about it and pointed out all of the dog hair that was in the transmitters, um, that uh, apparently that, that was uh, that concern was overridden by the longstanding friendship with the elderly couple. And I understand that. I, I mean, I, I kind of understand that. Uh, I think they wouldn't have had a place to live or it would have been difficult. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, so that that was quite the thing. Uh, by the way, when it flooded there, there was a boat. We would take a boat out to the transmitter site. Um, we changed, as you might imagine, we changed the filters on the AM and FM transmitters pretty regularly. And uh, oh, by the way, whenever we would show up, the gentleman who lived there would run in the transmitter building and start scraping up the piles that were on the floor in the transmitter building. So that that was truly horrible. You had to you had to hold your nose and just try not to breathe when you were there. 
So the other, now my other story though is instructional, and mm-hmm. I I was called to a a, uh, a site in Mississippi. Um, uh, dear friends of mine, the fact that the gentleman owner of the station has recently uh, recently passed on, uh, and and he said our satellite receiver is cutting out sometimes, and they use it quite a bit. It's cutting out. Okay, so I went there, and of course he wanted me to look at the satellite dish and the the coax and all that, and. I noticed, I noticed that at the same time, I heard the satellite receiver cutting out. The audio would just go away. And I don't know, something prompted me to go look at the front of the uh, the transmitter that was in there, that was in the same building. And I noticed that whenever the satellite receiver would cut out, the visor, the reflected power on the transmitter would also just tick up just briefly. It would tick upwards and then return to normal. And so, um, hmm. I went outside and looked at the tower, and there was a broken guy wire, and it was a, the wind was making it touch the FM antenna bays, uh-huh. and that was creating enough, you know, um, spurious, uh, you know, the, the sparks up there were creating plenty of RF, you know, all over the place, including apparently in the satellite band or in maybe an IF of the receiver, but uh, it, it was, yeah, yeah. So uh, I said. I said to the owner, owner, I won't say his name, dear sweet man. I said, uh, your problem's not the satellite receiver. You're going to have to get that guy wire fixed. He said, what? <laughs> said, yeah, that's the problem. So enough observation confirmed that that was the problem. Don't always look for, you know, what you think it might be. Yeah. Might be something else. That, that's uh, the, the one with the grass growing up that I had, uh, the, the picture came. I had that posted on the wall on customer service for years with a big sign on it that said, don't overlook the obvious. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, um, I was uh, doing an install in Nome once, and uh, and Alaska is beautiful in August. Um, actually, Nome is beautiful all year round, but it's much more comfortable in August. Um, and we were uh, coming back from dinner right after we got the transmitter on the air, and I said, we need to go to the site. And he goes, why? And I said, because uh, I hear it ticking. I hear the, uh, the, the there's something shutting the transmitter back. Because, you know, you, you get used to that quarter second interruption. So we drive out to the site and as we're getting a little closer, it's like I'm looking and it's like, Tom, I said, I think one of the skirt wires is loose is a skirt fed tower. And uh, we get a little closer again and it's like, no, that's not a skirt wire that's loose. That was a guy wire. And uh, we're right on the edge of the bearing straight with uh, the wind blowing. And uh, that was a little nervous time. What had happened was uh, one of the compression insulators had got put in with the as an uh, an expansion insulator and it had pulled apart under tension so definitely you uh you see some interesting things that way and uh we come up with engineers as engineers we tend to come up with some pretty creative solutions uh rich Hahn mentions too uh working with the university they used to make the admonition that uh plug strips and extension cords should only be used temporarily depending on where you are. So uh, definitely you're better off. We were talking about the uh, the power bars, right, Shane? Yep, the, uh, the PDUs, yep. Yeah, and in that one, you can get hardwired in ones that are much more, I guess, desirable than like a, a power bar, for example, correct? Right, you can get them in, in various flavors. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if having one that just, you know, has a socket that, you know, you plug that, you know, the, Plug it into a socket. I mean, if the if the, if the electrical inspector isn't happy with that, then uh, uh, then yeah, you can certainly get hardwired ones as well. Yep, yep. Uh, speaking of creative engineering, and I know we're we're starting to get close to the top of the hour, but uh, this is and, and I borrowed one of your pictures just to complete the set. So the photo on the left, the burned radome, that, that's just a, a picture that Shana provided. The repair to the right is a totally different burned radome story, although uh, I think they're similar brands. But, um, and this is another one that uh, Alex Hartman provided where you do what you gotta do to uh, get the job done, get it back on the air. And uh, I think that one, budgets being what they are, stayed that way for many, many years. Um, so, Shane, have you ever had to come up with any creative uh, compromises like that? Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, it's uh, there are times when at the site you do need to do the quick bubble gum and baling twine fix to get it back on the air. But again, back to that point of 
never leave it that way for any length of time. Always make sure you go back and fix it properly. Right. Yeah. I mean, you've you know, it's it's cool to uh, to get it going whenever you can, but uh, but by all means, if you can uh, make it permanent, and I mean sometimes you know for whatever reason, whether the owner won't spend the money or whatever, you may not have an option, but but you do um, the best you can. One, I'll give you one example of kind of a creative solution I had to come up with one time. Well, uh, the STL for a station had uh, completely gone dead, um, but fortunately I had some form of uh, well, I had a hotspot, I had an LTE hotspot. Uh, out at my transmitter site. So what I did was I actually ended up just um, using, uh, actually used my cell phone for a little while and pulled the station's audio stream and put that directly on the air. And uh, sure enough, it got them back on the air. But then I had to uh, to deal with the broken STL. Oh. Um, got one, well, I got one other STL story if you got time. Oh yeah, we're, we're going to run a couple of minutes late because I got a couple other, but, uh, but go ahead. So, so there was a station that was, uh, it was going off the air. Uh, it kept, uh, you know, every so often it would just trip off the air, and then eventually it might come back. Well, we finally traced it to the, uh, you know, to something in the STL. The carrier would stay up, but you know, we'd lose stereo pilot. This was a, or no, I, anyway, uh, we would lose. We would. We knew we were losing the audio link to the site somehow. Okay, um, I was, you know, as a contractor for this particular station, I didn't really, you know, hadn't really worked from all that much. Didn't know a whole lot about it. Um, go out to the transmitter site, and sure enough, just as we're pulling up, the station pulls, you know, goes back on the air. Um, only to a few minutes later, you know, go off the air. Well, look in the building, and this is a, a Mosley Starlink setup. And what do I find? There is a giant fan blowing ice cold air right on top of this STL transmit or the STL receiver. And guess what was happening? Every time that fan would kick in and basically mm -hmm. make the STL receiver. <laughs> Nice and frigid cold. Well, it would unlock, and uh, yeah. we lost audio. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I've seen a few like that where, as they get warmer or cooler, things will uh, come in or go out. Um, Rich Hahn also mentioned that he uh, keeps uh, spools of orange jacketed cable around for whenever he's got to install a temporary. It makes it real easy to spot the temporary fix, and it drives him crazy. So it reminds him to deal with it sooner rather than later. That's actually. That's actually a great idea. Yeah, and that is a good point because I know I will tend to use whenever I can different colored uh, cables for different uh, different functions, whether it's RF or uh, audio or, uh, you know, because these days it may all be CAT6. Well, not the RF so much, but the audio, the uh, IP, et cetera. So different, uh, different colors for different functions works really well. And uh, having something that was totally different again would be a really good point. Um, Gary Morell, you uh, had a story about an AMDA. I have clicked the unmute, so if you want to unmute yourself and uh, tell me your story, I think we'll uh, probably wrap it up with that one. Um, if you can't unmute yourself, then that's fine too. We'll just uh, carry on. But oh, I think I saw your mute flash, so give her a shot there. All right, there, you're good. Tell me a story. All right. Well, let's let's go with a little bit of a story here. Many years ago, um, and this is one of those, you know, you really want to do due diligence. Uh, we had an AM uh, station that got purchased because the price was just too good, and it was an FM standalone. And uh, so after the fact, I was approached to uh, go up and take a look at the uh, facility. So when I got on site, um, I'm looking at this, and I'm not going to mention names or location and stuff, but as we're as as I'm looking at the site, first of all, I, I see that there are um, muskrat hutches all over the three tower array out in what what should be the ground system, and no apparent way to get out to the towers except I found out later you would use a flat bottom skiff. But the thing that really troubled me was the fact that we had a um, we had open water out at one of the anchors, and so I asked the contract engineer. I said. Um, what is your, um, you know, I said, do you have any idea how big that anchor is? And he said, I have no idea. And I said, well, and he said, but it's been here since 1957. I said, uh, that's not my question. I'm concerned because it's sitting out there and it's submerged and it's out in open water. And uh, so concrete doesn't weigh very much. 
when it's when it's submerged. Matter of fact, you can make a boat out of concrete that'll float just fine. So, make a long story short, the day that the, uh, the sail closed, the tower collapsed because it Oops. picked up the anchor. Ice picked up the anchor and moved it. That the tower collapsed and. Uh, Come to find out, the property that the uh, Three Tower Array was sitting on was really part of the original 1837 um, lake bottom when the survey was made for the state. And so even though they had uh, title insurance on it, they couldn't rebuild there because the DNR says, uh, no, that's no. not even really your property. Oops. So. Awesome. Well, thanks, Gary. Yeah, that's... Uh just another example of how sometimes due diligence can become a, a really, really uh, a, a bigger challenge than you think. Um, one uh, comment that uh, Ray Lewis had made about uh, testing for, like, if you're doing repairs to a radome and you want to, uh, you know, to do a temporary fix like this, if you can uh, fit the materials into a microwave oven and uh, fire it up, maybe put a glass of water in just in case, but if the materials get hot, they're not good for RF. So that that's a really good point. Um, Shane, we're at the top of the hour, I think. Uh, is there anything else you can think of that you'd like to bring up? Um, boy, I think we've covered a lot of ground here, but uh, I guess it all really comes down to, um, you know, expect the unexpected. <laughs> it's an old cliche. Um, yeah. You never know what you're going to find when you get out to a site. I think, I mean, over the years, I've been to somewhere between 100 and 1,000 sites. I don't have a guess, but uh, I'll throw the dart at that wider range. And so I'll tell you my best one just as we, we close off. But uh, I was at a site in uh, an island country many, many, many miles from here. And uh, we walk into the site. We had to climb by foot up uh, about half a mile up a mountain to get to the site. The AC for the site ran along the side of the trail. It wasn't a road. Uh, no idea how they got the transmitter up there, but the, the transmitter building was a corrugated steel shack. And it was uh, built relatively upright. So the upper side of the shack, the uphill side, was dug about two feet into the ground. The downhill side was two feet up in the air. And uh, you, the transmitter was crammed in there. You had to take one of the steel panels off the shack, the, take the wall off, the corrugated wall, to be able to read the meters. And uh, anyway, so whatever I was doing required taking the output connector off. And as I take the last bolt out of the output connector and lift the coax, the transmitter fell over on me because it, the coax was what was holding it up. So that's my uh, sight horror story. Um, you know, things that could have been done better. Uh, John Van Milligan mentions one of their engineers just found a new security system at a transmitter site in the form of a hornet's nest. And that's another thing that we do run into a lot at sites. Um, so, you know, do you have a favorite way? I mean, everybody says mothballs again for inside the building, but uh, do you carry a can of bug spray with you, Shane? Certainly doesn't hurt. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've ended up having to uh, shoot down a few, <laughs> a few hornets nests from time to time. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think we've pretty much hit the, hit the wall for time. We've got the usual resources page, webinars, uh, new waves newsletter just came out uh, with all kinds of cool things, including a tips article that uh, the best tips article ever is the one that I don't write myself. Uh, so it uh, draws a lot on input from other folks. And of course, uh, this archive and all, or this webinar and a bunch of our other stuff is uh, archived on the YouTube channel. So on that note, Shane, I want to thank you very much for giving up some of your work day to uh, spend some time with us. I know you've got uh, got things to do. You you are literally at a transmitter site right now, aren't you? Uh, I am, in fact. In fact, I'm watching a tower crew uh, put up some coax right now. There are electricians in the building, so yeah, a lot of stuff going on. It's uh, hopefully it's have a there. signal on the air by the end of the week. Yeah. All right. Well, if anybody hollers headache, duck and cover. On that note, folks, <laughs> I want to thank you. And thanks again, Shane, for joining us. And everybody, have a wonderful day. And we'll see you next time. Bye now.